class, one little book. That's one of the fifth. There's five one, one chapter books in the Bible. I mentioned it to you before. For those who care, Obadiah is one. It's the Old Testament. Obadiah. Then you got one, two, Philemon. Obadiah, Philemon. One, two, three, two, three, John. Obadiah, Philemon, two, three, John, and Jude. Those are your five books in order. Obadiah, Philemon, second John, third John, Jude. One page. That's it. But one page is loaded. So Jude. Again, a general epistle, written around the same time, that 64 AD period. And Jude is not written by the Apostle Paul. It's not written by Peter. It's written by Jude. Well, who's Jude? Well, let's read it and sing. And the theme of Jude pretty much is a warning. Just to make that simple, it's a warning to the church. The theme is a warning, and it's... Um, and it, it, it's, it's appropriate because it's the last book before Revelation. So it's a warning to the church to get things right. before the Because in Revelation, it was explained to somebody the other day, the church isn't in Revelation. Un, unlike what most Bible teachers will tell you, chapters 1, and I'm going to do that in a couple of weeks. I'm going to go through Revelation. I'll explain the whole thing. But break it down for you. But, you know, once you get past chapter 3 in Revelation, church is gone. And it's all dealing with Israel going through the tribulation. But uh, so it's a warning. Jude's a warning to get things right, and we're going to look at it. Now, let's read a couple of verses. Start at verse 1. Written by the apostle Jude, the brother of James. I'll explain it in a second. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, and called, mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave, you, gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you, and exhort you, and watch, watch, that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Amen? Amen. That's a verse that literally I could tell you. With, 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 I told the story. I was in 645 Fifth Avenue. I still picture it. I was with Alicia Lowry. And Alicia was sitting there. I was giving, giving her a Bible study. And 645 Fifth was the Olympic Tower Building. You might remember that one? And it, it went through 50, 51st, 52nd. And I'm sitting on a little, little, little kind of leather couch in the lobby. There's a piano there. And I was going to a little Bible discipleship course with Alicia. And this guy walks by. I mean, I'm talking many years ago, and I was just walked by real fast, and he looked at me doing it, and he goes, earnestly contend for the faith. Where is that? Just like that. I don't know if he was an angel or what. Earnestly contend for the faith. Where is that? Without missing a beat, it's a Jude verse 3. Thanks. And he kept walking. And she said, wow, you knew that one? Said, yeah, I happen to know that verse. <laughs> you know, and he walked. I never saw the guy. I know who he was. So where, where, yeah. Earnest to contend for the faith. Where is that? I said, uh, Jude 3. Okay, thanks. Boom. That's, every time I read this verb, I think of that. I can still picture the guy walking by me. I couldn't tell you what it looked like. It was real quick. It was a 10-second conversation. And Alicia was like, what was that about? I said, I have no idea. Alicia, maybe it was the Lord. Maybe. Well, I passed. I passed the test. <laughs> when you don't know, you say, I don't know. It's in there somewhere. It's in there somewhere. That's the other answer. If you don't know the verse. All right. So the warning. Let's look at Jude again, the servant of Jesus, the brother of James. Now, you know James and John. Come on, help me out. What? Zebedee. Zebedee is the father's name. James and John. So there's two Jameses. Two James. And three today. Amen. So got James and John Zebedee. This isn't James Zebedee. What happened to James Zebedee? He gets killed. He gets killed, first one. Besides Stephen, as non, a non-apostle, he's the first apostle to get killed, James. So we know it's not James Zebedee. And Judas, Jude, the brother, Jude is short for Judas. It's also sh short for another name. And I'll show you who this is. Now, there's two Jameses, and the other James is called James the Less. Turn with me to uh, Mark 3.18.
Mark, uh, wait a minute, Mark 1540 I got. Let me see if that's it. Or Mark 310. Let's see which one it is. Might be both of them. Well, look at, yeah, th then we're going to go to 1540 after. Go to 318, Mark 318. We're identifying who this Jude is. By the way, one of the Lord's brothers was Jude. Remember that? Yeah. Mark, but that's not him. That's something different. The only of the Lord's brothers that gets it right is James. Another James. But that James heads up the church in Jerusalem, and he doesn't write this epistle because he's the brother of... James, brother of Jude. Jude, the brother of James. We wouldn't identify it, the brother of our Lord. It's something different. Uh, look at John, Mark 3.18. He mentions the apostles here. Look at 17. James, the son of Zebedee. 17. John, the brother of James. He surnamed them Boangers, which is the sons of thunder. And Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew, and Thomas, here it is, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite. Notice that, James, the son of Alphaeus. That's how this other James is known, James, the son of Alphaeus. Turn to Mark 1540. Mark 1540. So he's got two names, James, the son of Alphaeus. That shows up a number of times. I referenced it. You don't have to look at it. Shows up in Matthew 10, Luke 5, Mark 3, James, the son of Alphaeus. So it's not James, the son of Zebedee. Everybody got that? That's how you know it's not the same one. Okay, look at Mark 15, 40. There were also women looking on afar off, among them, among whom was Mary Magdalene at the cross, and Mary, the mother of James the Le what? James the Less. And of Josie's and Salome. So James, so Mary, the mother of James the Less, and of Josie's. That was the mother. And James the Less is another name for James, the son of Alph Alphaeus. The son of Alphaeus. And that's the one who writes this. He's one of the apostles, but he's not the Lord's brother. The Lord's brother, again, shows up in Acts 15. He heads up the church in Jerusalem, and he appears in 1 Corinthians. Now, you know the difference because when it says the Lord's brother James, it identifies him such. Do you know that? No? Come on. 1 Corinthians 15. Watch. It identifies him that way. That's how you know what, it, you, what you're talking about. I mean, the Bible names can be confusing. I'll give you that. And if you don't study it out, you're not going to get it right. Or listen to me. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 15. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 15. Okay, verse 7. Uh, after the 500 fell asleep, the 500, he witnessed the resurrected Christ, 500. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. James, then of what? Well, who's James then? The Lord's brother. Watch. And last of all, he was seen of me, Paul, as one born at a due time, due season. Um, and there's another reference where it says the Lord's brother, James. No, he wasn't an apostle. Correct, that's what I'm saying. That's why he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. James was the Lord's brother. It shows up here, 1 Corinthians 15. It also shows up, I don't have the reference in front of me or my head, the Lord's brother. It could be in Galatians, but I'm not going to look for it now. As you have to trust me, it's the Lord's brother, James. And this James here, again, is James the less or James the son of Alphaeus. Let's get back to Jude. I want to get on. I got some more stuff here. So you got James... Son of Zebedee, one. James, the less, or son of Alphaeus, two. 
And you got James, Lord's brother, who takes over the council in Acts 15. Um, I'll give you the reference real quick. Uh, let's see. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, George. I, I, I thought it was a glitch in my head. But, and it also in if Acts 15, it tells you about James. So Galatians 119, thank you, George. That says James, the Lord's brother. And if you read it in Acts 15, where they have the first council, James presides over that. So he wasn't an apostle. He was, I mean, now that I'm stuck on it, look at Mark 6, 3. This is where you'll see the whole picture. Mark 6, 3. Galatians 1.19, beautiful. Mark 6.3. I mean, you ever study how many Marys are in the Bible? How many Simons are in the Bible? Are you kidding me? Not as many James. There's a bunch of them. All right, look at Mark 6.3. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of who? Say it. James and Joses and of Judah and Simon. See? And if it was the Lord's brother, that was the apostle, they would have clearly told you that, but it didn't. He's the son of Alphaeus. All right, let's go back to Jude. In Galatians 1.19, George said, that's the one that has the one I was thinking about, uh, the Lord's brother. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Perfect. James, the Lord's brother. That's the other one. All right, go back to Jude. Let's go. I like, look, let's look at verse 3 for a minute. It's a great practical application. Look at the end of that verse. Exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Can somebody say amen? amen? You know what you have to do today? Earnestly contend for the faith. That was once delivered unto the saints. You've got to fight. You've got to fight the good fight of faith. You gotta, if you're not going to earnestly contend for the faith, you're going to fall. If you're not going to contend, you're not going to fight. You know, either we, either we fight for the Lord or we fight against the Lord. Everybody's fighting. You're fighting for them or against them. So I'm not fighting against them. If you're not with me, you're what? See? So you got to fight for them and earnestly contend for the faith. That was once delivered to the saints. Earnestly. The effectual, earnest, effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Earnest, effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth. Earnest. Diligently, earnestly praying, earnestly contending. Show up to, to church, tell people about Jesus. That was a good witness you had, uh, James and George. That was a great witness with that guy, with James, the other James. Big James. Yeah, so that was great. You had a good witness. I'm glad you got that in. That was, that was the perfect way to offset your initial encounter. That was, that's, that, that's beautiful. Um, so pray, earnestly contend for the faith. You know, look at uh, Hebrews for a minute. Hebrews 10. Twenty-four. Earnestly contend for the faith. We sing a song, and when we sing the songs, I wonder when we sing them, we like them at the moment. Sometimes, if you pause for a second to think about what you're singing. Though none go with me, yet I will follow. What, what, what? Though none go with me, yet I will follow. You know why? He's earnestly contending for the faith. I mean, you, I want everyone to show up at church. I pray all the time. And if they don't come, they don't come. It's, I'm still going to do what I have to do. And you're going to do what you got to do. Right. Earnestly contend for the faith. Look at uh, Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking the assembling. Of, you know this verse. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves. Don't give up. Earnestly what? Contend. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. So much more you see that day approaching. Exhort each other. Exhort them what? Come to church. Pray. Read. Don't give up. Witness. Invite people to church. I had a great witness the other day with the young guy who did the power washing. Bernadette met him too at the house. He did the rugs here. Young guy. Nice guy. 
trying to get him to come to church, trying to give him tracts, talk, preach to him a little bit about the Lord. Nice guy, he's tender. Oh, I think I'm going to come. He was impressed with the drum set. I said, well, meet, meet. he's a drummer. I said, well, meet Phil. He's a professional drummer, this guy. Oh, really? What's his name? So that caught his attention. We talked a little bit. So you never know. Earnestly contend. Fight. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith, not the good fight of the flesh. You know, fight the good fight of the flesh, you'll end up in trouble. But fight the good fight of the faith is what we need to do. All right, look at verse 4. I'm going to read through this for a minute. I want to get to verse 7 and explain it. Verse 6. Let's look at this here. Uh, 4 says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old, old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They're just, they're wicked. They make a mockery of God. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this. Can you say backslidden? They knew it, but they were not following God anymore. I will put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Remember they, you know, came out of Egypt, they wandered 40 years. They eventually died in the wilderness, except Joshua and Caleb and the kids. Then they went into the promised land. But he didn't kill them right away when they were in rebellion. When they didn't go into the land after God promised, he could have killed them right then. He didn't kill them. He let them wander 40 years to teach them a lesson. What was the lesson? They said, we can't go in. The giants will kill us and our kids. And they said, our kids? What about our kids? Oh, you're interested in your kids? Okay. You're going to wander 40 years, and guess what? The kids will live, and you'll die. You can't, you can't reason, you can't out-reason God. Just do what he says, all right? His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He said, go in, go in. Don't start giving reasons why you can't go in. As soon as you do that, you're not walking by what? Faith. I was telling you this morning, right? That's it all comes, the whole Christian journey comes down to walk by faith, not by sight. The whole thing. I'm not preaching on that today. I should. Walk by faith, not by sight. That's the whole thing. We live in a world that's visceral, visual, existential. You see things, you touch, you feel, you look. And then, then you're told to walk by faith. So it's a, it's a challenge. But that's the challenge. You know, God, I think of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, or Adam, before he even made Eve, and he's got that one tree in the middle of the garden, in the midst of the garden. I don't know how many trees are there. I like to use illustrations of numbers so we could visualize it. I'm just guessing. I don't know. I, don't, I have no idea. I'm just saying for an application, or for an illustration. If there was a thousand trees, take one away, you could have 999 trees you could eat off, right? Right? If there was 100 trees, you got 99, whatever the number is. You had all those other trees you could, you could eat off. But the one tree he told him not to is the one he messed up with. It was the one she messed up, got deceived. She gets deceived. And then he follows suit. But why would that, if you ever notice it, it's in the midst of the garden? Right smack in the middle. Like right here, you're, you're in the middle of a world, again, with visual activity and motion and senses that, that belie our faith. It's always pulling on you and trying to pull you away from what the Word of God is. We walk by faith, not by sight. But why did God give us eyes? To see where you're going. But you don't, that's not for your spiritual journey. That's for your physical journey. You don't drive with your eyes closed like some people do. Your eyes closed, texting, who knows what they're doing. Driving the wrong way in the road. What are you doing? Probably texting. I saw a UPS guy, a, 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 an Amazon truck. It was, an, it was like a professional driver. He was coming the wrong way on bicycle. I said, what? what? I mean, I was far enough away. Like, like, dude, what are you doing? Eventually, he straightened out and he got back into the right lane, but probably not before he was doing this. Said, oh, I better get over. God help us. The devices of man. We are ignorant. We are ignorant of his. What? We are not ignorant of his devices. 
<laughs> Good morning, everybody. Let's go to verse 6. And the angels, now this is a warning, this book, right? So what's the warning here? Watch. And the angels which kept not their first estate, well, what's the first estate of the angels? Heaven, right, spiritual realm, exactly. They kept not the first estate, but left their own habitation, heaven. He hath reserved an everlasting chains under darkness, under judgment of the great day. Those angels that, not all the angels, listen, that fell with, fell with Satan, a third of the angels fell with him. A third of the angels fell. Not, not all a third of the angels did this. But the ones that did this, he got them in chains in everlasting darkness till the day of judgment. What did they do? Look at verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities round about them, in like manner, watch, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Fire. So you might read that and get a little confused. There's two things going on here. Number one, you got the angels that left their first estate. They went after strange flesh. What strange flesh to an angelic being? Humans, correct, humans. So in Genesis 6, we're going to turn to Genesis 6, and we'll come right back to Jude. Go to Genesis 6 for a minute. That's the strange flesh he's referring to. Look at verse 2. Notice this takes place before the flood. Come on, pay attention. Verse 2. That the sons of God, sons of God, sons of God are fallen angels in the Old Testament. So when you and I get saved, he gave us power to become the what? Sons of God. We replace those sons of God that fell, that woke up with Job up and down. Where would you come from, the sons of God? Going up and down, and they came up to heaven with Job, the sons of God. Sons of God are fallen angels. Not, not, not all the fallen angels did what these guys did, but the ones that did this, we don't know the number, they're chained and put in hell. So look, it says, verse 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, as to make a distinction, spiritual beings, physical beings. So the daughters meant that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. In other words, at that point, they were living to seven, 800 years old, up to this point. After this, to 120. That's about it. Joshua was 110. Joseph was 110. You know, Jacob was 137, like that. Some made it longer. Verse uh, 4. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God, watch it, came in, in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were men of old, men of renown. Wow. Their offspring were giants. Do I see that? The offspring of giants. This was, this was spiritual being mating with a woman and, ha and the offspring like a Goliath. Now, there's something going on there that I'm not going to explain right now because it's a little heavy. But there's a, the, Lord, the devil knows a more, he, the devil knows more about everything than anybody but God. And the Lord was born of the Holy Spirit impregnating Mary years later. I don't know if they had a heads up what was going to happen, but that's what they tried to do with the reverse order. It was demonic. Yeah, yeah. But they somehow probably had a heads up to that. I don't know. But that's exactly what they Because how could a spirit being impregnate a woman? I have no idea. How the Holy Ghost overshadow Mary? I have no idea. Nor do you. But we know that it happened. Amen? And we know that that perversion was so bad that's why I said their thoughts were evil continually, verse 4. 
And that's what brought in the flood. So go back to Jude for a minute and watch this. What, what, what brought in the flood back in Noah's flood? Sexual perversion on the highest order. Spirit beings mating with women. And he said, that's it, I'm done. What else happens? Look at, look at Jude. Verse 6. The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved. Okay, verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. But wait a minute. Sodom and Gomorrah weren't angels. That was angels of the first day. What were they? They were, they were homosexuals. And they were going to get strange flesh. What strange flesh for a man? Man. Man. Come on. Go, go to Romans 1. Hey, listen. This is a Bible study, right? Watch. Go to Romans 1. The Bible answers everything. I mean, the problem is the world hates the Bible because the world condemns the Bible. And when the world condemns what the world, when the word condemns what the world says is okay, you have two choices, either change or get rid of it. Right? So what the Bible says, I don't care what the Bible says. Well, that's suffering, the vengeance of eternal, as an example. What happened to Psalm and Gomorrah? They got blew up. So look at Romans 1, 27. I mean, this is pretty straightforward. You can't. You can't mince words here. And if you believe, you don't want to believe it, don't believe it. Or you believe, you're a Christian. You believe it? Say amen. amen. And likewise also, the men leaving, watch, the natural use of the woman, that's why it was strange flesh for them. Burning in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Men with men working working that which is unseemly. I'm not going to get any more graphic. You understand. Amen? That's it. What is that? Go back to Jude. That was an example. Why did he give them Sodom and Gomorrah? As an example to show you that's what's going to happen. Giving themselves over to fornication in the middle part of verse 7 and going after strange flesh. Strange flesh was either a human flesh for the angels and men with men. Both work. Are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. I mean, I'm glad I'm saved, aren't you? You know, Ken Grimble had texted me this morning that his sister that he went to see last week in Pennsylvania, she passed away. She passed away on Thursday. He got to see her Sunday, though. He got to sing with her. He, he, she was the older sister. She was 89. He'd sing with her, and she got saved at 10 years old, he said. So she was saved almost her whole life. And um, they got to sing together. He took a little video, he said. And it, it goes, and I'm, I saw, I, I said, I'm sorry for your loss, but your sister's gain. He said, amen, you know. I said, thank God you're saved and many of your family Many of loved ones we know are saved. That gives us peace because one day, death will claim all of us. And where will you go? We made it right with God so you know where you're going. Amen? And I said, so we'll miss you. And he misses Blessed Hope. I can't wait to come back. I miss you guys. We miss you too. So we pray for Ken Grimm. We'll keep him safe. But she passed on at 89. Uh, Big Jim and Sharon had to go to a I believe her daughter's party, Jim, she, Jennifer, she's 40. I think it was today. I think it was today. If they show up, then it was yesterday because they borrowed the coffee urn. If they went yesterday, they'll be here today. Um, and hopefully he's feeling better with his kidneys starting to heal up. Um, Anne and Marie and Tom are upstate. They had to go because his aunt, uncle died a while ago. They're having some family function up there. So that's what's going on. But the update, that was the update. Let's go back here, verse 7. I gave you that. By the way, one last thing. Look at Matthew 24, 37. Matthew 24, 37. I was telling somebody the other day that when Noah's flood 
He brought in the flood, destroyed the world. That represents the tribulation. Okay? Right? You with me, church? Yeah. Keep that in mind. It's very important for the lesson today. Watch. I'm going to give you that in a second. Look at Matthew 24, 37. 24, 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. As the days of Noah. Ah, eating, drinking, fornication, wild, and then God said, that's it, I'm done. And he blew it up. And he flooded out the world. As it was then, so shall it be now. So sexual perversion brought in that Noah's flood. Sexual perversion precedes the Lord's coming. And it, you, I don't even want to know what's out there, what's going on. What, the things I hear are enough to hear. Are you with me? So does no, keep that in mind. Noah's flood, tribulation. That's important. Come with me back to Jude. This one book is loaded. I'm not going to get through this, but look at verse 9. Let's get through this verse. Verse 9. Go back to Jude 9. Yet Michael, the archangel, watch this. James, pay attention. This is a good one. 9, verse 9, watch. Yet Michael, the archangel, the only archangel in the Bible is Michael. That's the only one. Gabriel's an angel, but the archangel is Michael. The Michael is, you know, you're the patron saint of Italy, the patron saint of Ireland. You know what the patron saint of Israel is? Michael. He, if you want to use that term, he's their saint. He's their angel that looks for Israel. So, yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked thee. Wow. Michael was sent by God to get Moses' body. Moses died in Mount Pisgah in Deuteronomy 34. He dies. And before he's buried, God says, Michael, go get his body. Get, get his body, literally. And take his body, literally, up to heaven. Don't bury him. As they were burying him, he said, no, no, no. And he contended with the devil. The devil said, no, let go. And bring him down. He wasn't going to hell. He was going in the grave. Got it? But Michael was sent by God to get his body. So he's contending with the devil. The devil is so powerful that Michael the archangel, the only archangel in the Bible, he says, the Lord rebuke thee. Not get away, Satan. The Lord rebuked thee. You think you're a match for the devil? You're no match for the devil. You pose no threat to the devil. That's why you got to come to him in the name of Jesus Christ and plead the blood of Christ and quote scripture and tell him to get off in Jesus' name. You, 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 you think you're going to intimidate the devil? Michael the archangel said, the Lord rebuked thee. He took that body and went straight up to heaven with it. Look at Deuter Deuteronomy 34. By the way, just to let you know, Michael is the, is the archangel of Israel. Michael shows up here in Jude. He shows up in, watch this, Daniel 12. You don't turn there, watch. Daniel 12. Pay attention. Revelation 12. Daniel 12, Revelation 12. How many tribes are there? 12. What's the Jewish number? 12. 12 stars in Revelation 12. 12 is Israel's number. 144,000 Jews, 12 times 12,000, 144,000. So 12 is always connected with Israel. And he shows up in Daniel 12, Revelation 12. The Bible, numerology in the Bible is amazing because numbers don't lie. We lie, not numbers. That's why they do creative accounting, to make the numbers say what they want it to say. All, you know, business people and politicians do that stuff. Oh, this, I'll oh, be quiet. <laughs> they manipulate numbers to make it say what they want because you can't argue with numbers. Two times two is always going to be four, isn't it? All right, let's go, uh, go back with me to uh, Deuteronomy 34. Thank you. 
Deuteronomy. Thirty-four. Let's look at verses one, five, and seven. This is when Moses dies. Deuteronomy thirty-four, verse one. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mount of Nebo to the top of Pisgah, that is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead and the Dan. So, in other words, before he died, God took Moses up to the mountaintop. He said, "You know, you can't go in the promised land, but I'm going to show you the promised land." because you couldn't get in. So let me show it to you. He gave him a panoramic view of north, south, all of Israel. Now look at verse 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. Oh, they buried him. So they thought because no man found his sepulcher, because Michael, watch, when disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, rebuked him and took it up to glory. So Moses goes back up to heaven. Revelation 11, you got two witnesses that show up for 42 months. Who shows up in Matthew 17 next to Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses, say it again, and Elijah. Well, Moses got taken up by Michael's body. What happened to Elijah back in 2 Kings 4? He went up in a whirlwind. So he got, he got taken up while he was still alive. Moses died, then gets taken up. They both represent different factions. One represents the Christian. One represents the tribulation saint that gets raptured while he's still alive. Moses represents the tribulation saint that dies believing and gets taken up. Moses comes back and dies again. Elijah comes back to die once. He never died, but he's going to come back and die. Because in Revelation 11, those two witnesses preach for 42 months, and then what happens to them? They get beheaded. They get beheaded. Who's the only person that lived and never died? Enoch. And Enoch represents us all. Oh, Wait a minute, Enoch is Genesis 5. He gets taken. He gets taken up, watch. The flood comes in chapter 6. What did I tell you the flood represented? Tribulation. tribulation. Enoch went up, what, before the tribulation? Are you with me? Church goes up before the tribulation? John, James, in John, in Revelation 4, 1, John the apostle gets taken up to glory and see things that are going to take place before the tribulation is unfolded, it is the clearest picture in your Bible of the church getting raptured prior to the event of the tribulation breaking forth. So Genesis 5 is clear. I want you to turn me to Hebrews for a minute. You could look at it later. I'm not going to go there. Genesis 5. Um, but look at uh, Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11.5. Eleven five and Genesis five Genesis five twenty four you can make a note of it. Genesis five twenty four says that Enoch was three hundred sixty five years old and God took him. God took him. Now look at look at Hebrews eleven five. By faith. Say it again. By what? By faith. Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Well, amen. So Enoch shows up in three places. Enoch shows up in Genesis 5, Hebrews 11, and Jude. One more time. Go back to Jude and we'll close right here. Jude. Let's skip down to verse 14 for a minute. To finish this thought. Jude 14. Come on, everybody got that? And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon the all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Can you say ungodly? 
I mean, did he make that clear? The world is ungodly. And what is, what, what, let, let's not miss the message. Who's coming back with the Lord there? Enoch. See that? Verse 14. He's the t- coming back with the Lord with 10,000 of his saints. Oh, what does that represent? Revelation 19. The Lord coming back with a name written on his thigh. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, faithful and true. Word of God. He comes back with the church behind him. Battle of Armageddon. Enoch represents the church that comes back with the Lord because he's the body that goes up prior to tribulation. Enoch never died. If you get raptured today, tomorrow, this week, you're still alive. You'll never die. But the Bible says it's pointed to man once to die, then after this is judgment. Yeah, that's true. In 99.99% of the time, there's an exception. Elijah was one, and two is Enoch. But Elijah will die. Enoch never died. Enoch never died. If you get raptured right now, we never die. Say amen. And we'll finish up next week. Correct. No, 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 no. You don't die, though. You, you, you don't die. You go from here to there. He, you're taken. You're still conscious. The fact that our body changes is immaterial, George, because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So we change, but we don't die. Enoch was translated. He was, see, Elijah got killed. He died. I mean, he went up. He comes back. He's going to die again. Gets beheaded. He never got killed. Enoch never dies. We get raptured, alive and remain. The dead in Christ rise first. Watch. The dead in Christ rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. And so shall we ever be with them forever. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Somebody say amen. amen. So, no, you don't die. You get translated. Yeah. Father, be with us, Lord, and bless the teaching. Bring others in safe. Those that missed it, let them listen. And I'll finish it up next week, and then we'll start Revelation. So it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.